more who want to but don't know it yet because they simply haven't found what we are giving them or what we can give them. That's the point. That in itself is a great, great contribution to the world from the Vedic path. The more we uphold our principles and let others know why they are important, the more they will also adopt our ways. I just met somebody in Florida. He was, he's a vegetarian, he used to bring his Indian lunch to work, and he used to keep it hidden. He didn't want anybody know, to know what he ate, right? Well, first of all, somebody started to ask, well, what are you eating? He explained why he was a vegetarian. He explained the Ayurvedic principles behind what he was eating, the ingredients, and now he's got 30 people out of the 80 that he works with, which loves Indian cooking. The point is, it doesn't hurt to try, it doesn't hurt to be open. Like I said, people are wanting to know what you have. This is also why real Hindus need to be educated in their culture and to realize how profound, deep, and special it is, and what knowledge it contains. Then they will be proud of their culture and follow it. After all, we have nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to be afraid of. We are representations of and participants in the most profound and oldest of all spiritual traditions and cultures, and it has the deepest of all spiritual knowledge. And I'll argue anyone who doesn't agree with that. The only thing is that many people don't know that, and I dare say that many Hindus also do not fully know how deep and profound it is because of lacking the education of their own path. This needs to change. And this lack of knowledge is the prime reason why Hindus in India may convert to some other religion. We're dealing with that on a continually increasing basis. To help make this change, we also need to understand that it is a fact that without proper measures of defense and promotion of our culture, you cannot give proper protection to it. And I'm not talking about proselytizing. I'm just letting you know that we have to promote what we have in order to gather more support, more followers, more people who are interested. It is a tough world and things have changed. Most wars now in this world are 80% intellectual. They're not all military. We now have to use our intelligence to show what our culture is in order to really protect and preserve it from those who are always trying to demean and criticize it. We must understand that apathy is an enemy. Apathy, the tendency to do nothing, is our greatest enemy. We must conquer our own apathy wherever we may find it. This, in fact, is the teachings of Lord Krishna to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. Are you a follower of Bhagavad Gita? Are you a follower of Sanatana Dharma? Then we must conquer our apathy and take a stand for doing something to maintain Vedic Dharma. We have to be fearless to protect and promote Vedic Dharma. And that's why I'm honored and proud to share the stage today with such people as Dr. Subramanian Swami and Kamal Kumar Swami. They are examples of the fearlessness of which I speak. I am honored in this way. I'm honored to be in front of you, and I'm honored to be proud to be called a Hindu, a follower of Sanatana Dharma. But we should all be honored and proud in the same way and willing to work together. We don't have to proselytize, but we can share the benefits of what our culture has given to us and to the world. For example, in Sekundarabad, near Hyderabad, a few years ago, there was a Krishna temple that the government wanted to move in order to widen the road. But all the local Hindus came together with a big demonstration to protest, and the state actually backed down. This shows what, begun, what can be done and what has to be done when Hindus unite and shows that we can continue, that we must continue to do this. Then people will take us more seriously and reconsider before they simply get up to offend Hindus and think that there will be no reaction. People will hesitate before taking Hindus lightly or making us upset, but we have to have a determination to make a stand. And once we begin to work in this way, we cannot stop it, must continue for the long term and never stop until the goal is reached. 
Sometimes just by doing a little endeavor, we don't know and may even be surprised at what doors of opportunity will open for us. Sometimes all it takes is that we just start, just put one step in front of the other, and suddenly we step into a force, a current of energy that lifts us along like nothing we have experienced, like a reciprocation from something that is far greater than that which exists within ourselves, but something that far exceeds our own expectations and our own individual power. We have no idea how many times this has happened to me. And I'm sure many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. So can you imagine what would happen if all of us stepped forward in unity for the Dharma and open ourselves to that opportunity to make a difference? Plus, the more we all step forward to do something together, the easier it becomes for everyone. You do a little bit, I do a little bit, pretty soon something big is happening, just like this event today. Everybody steps forward, does a little something, and a nice, beautiful event like this takes place. This is what I'm talking about. It is one thing, however, to say that we are united, and quite another to work and act united, engaged in concerted efforts as one community to protect, defend, and promote our culture. It should not matter whether we are Vaishnavs, Shaivites, Brahmanandis, Shaktas, or even Bengalis, Gujaratis, Tamils, Rajasthanis, or may I say Americans, or any ethnicity. Because when one aspect of the Vedic tradition is threatened, demeaned, or unnecessarily criticized, then it is the whole culture that is under attack. And we must see it that way. We must step forward and be strong dharmas and make a stand for our tradition and its future. So let us support each other in friendship, in dharmic brotherhood and sisterhood. Let us not become divided by minor or superficial differences or labels, but let us gather and see our unity, our similarities, as spiritual beings, all part of the Supreme Spirit. That is the ultimate teaching of Bhagavad Gita and Vedic Shastra. That perception of reality is becoming increasingly rare these days in society but it is an inherent principle and basic reality of Vedic Dharma and Dharmic civilization. That is why I call it the last bastion of deep spiritual truth. Because if we ever lose Vedic culture, the world has no idea of what its loss truly is. It is the Vedic culture which holds the essential spiritual understanding, which is beyond simply moralistic ethics, and gives you the higher principles of self-realization. It gives you direct access to the absolute, the supreme, not only by descriptions, but by offering the methods by which we can perceive and directly experience it by spiritualizing our consciousness. Basically, you find that nowhere else, not to this extent. It gives us one of the last hopes for true world peace, actually. Let us not forget that and also help each other raise our consciousness and maintain that spiritual vision of who and what we really are. That will also pave the way for a truly united Hindu society. There is no greater need for Hindu unity than right now, since there are forces that are also gathering that are trying to work against us. As we've heard, the problem is that it is in our nature to respect everyone. And there's nothing wrong with that, except everyone, not everyone, wants to return the same respect back towards us. In fact, there are those who would like to see our complete extinction, the complete demise of Hinduism or Vedic culture if they could such as we have seen in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Kashmir, and so on, in other parts of India. How long does it take before it becomes obvious that we must stand together, even if only to preserve and protect what remains of our culture, and preserve and protect the homeland of our culture, Mother India, Bharat Varsha? We must also, 
We must also recognize that people or groups who mean to do us harm or even wish for our extinction and then defend ourselves and our culture from their attacks, whatever they may be. But we need to be proactive and develop long-term plans, not merely wait for something to happen and then show some knee-jerk reaction. There are many who already know this and are already working this way, but can you imagine if the whole baby community acted in this way together and supported such plans? It would have profound effects. But many of these more detailed plans, you can read about in my book, Crimes Against India, and the need to protect its ancient native tradition. But essentially, you need, we need, we all need to work in a way where we can decide where we want to be in five more years. Where is the Hindu community going to be in five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 or 20 years from now? Where are we going to be, where do we want to be in 20 years and start making plans of action so that we can reach those goals? That's what we need to do. The thing of it is, we still have a sizable population of nearly 1 billion Hindus around the world. But have you ever wondered why we are still not as formidable a force as we should be? In places like America, Indians, most of which are Hindus, are one of the wealthiest ethnic groups in the country. And we are certainly gathering influence here. Many more Indians are entering politics like never before. But we still have not become as formidable a force in the world as we could be. And why is that? Well, it's simple, quite really. It's because of a lack of organized effort, too much apathy, but primarily a lack of unity amongst us. Many times we come across people who want to do the same things as we do. I want to create something, he wants to do the same thing, but the problem is,